Okay, when we talk about what's going on, think about this top left here. You're starting to relax. We're over here. Uh, we're getting ready to fall asleep. Everything's starting to calm down. We actually fall asleep then. If we're asleep at Nick, our airway starts to narrow. Because of that tube that Guy's talking about that gets smaller, the air moving through there, it causes the tissue to vibrate. We get the snoring. The airway closes down to the point where it actually collapses. In that case, we have an apnea. We become hypoxic and hypercatnic. Uh, hypoxia, as you well know, is too little oxygen. We're using up oxygen. Hypercapnia is a word for too much CO2. So if no air is coming in and no air is going out, we're using it up and we're building up CO2. It's no different than being at the bottom of a swimming pool trying to hold your breath. What happens? Your brain says, you better breathe, you better breathe. So we come up out of a deeper sleep towards a lighter sleep. We arouse. We may not actually wake up, but our sleep patterns are changing. There are activators that activate our pituitary gland to give us a squirt of adrenaline. Adrenaline is that fight or flight hormone and that is a smooth muscle contractor that hits the airway and it opens the airway. So those of you who have witnessed apneas, you hear the snoring that and then the airway closes down and then there's that you know that kind of snort or something like that then the airway, the, the adrenal activation lasts for 10, 20 seconds. You get a few breaths in, you start to relax, you fall asleep, and the same thing happens over and over again. What is it in this that bothers you, looking at that guy? Well, a couple things. First of all, I, I want to say that your patients will say, I don't wake up. And so make sure you understand an arousal from sleep does not mean you wake up. It means you go from deeper sleep into lighter sleep. So uh, that's one of the big misnomers in it. You, well, I don't wake up, so I sleep fine. Most of these people say they sleep all night, but they may wake up tired. Uh, the other thing is I want to make note of is that, you know, you said it's like holding your breath at the bottom of the pool. Well, it's actually worse than that because most of these apneas occur at the end of expiration. So when you breathe out, that's when the airway collapses. So it's like blowing all your air out and then quitting breathing for 10 seconds or greater. And you see these studies where someone does that for 45 seconds. I mean, most of us can't hold our breath for 45 seconds alone, much less when you breathe out and then don't breathe in. Uh, when you watch someone who has this and you see their sleep studies and you see their heart rate go up and their O2 sats go tank and go through, through the bottom, you become very passionate about fixing this. You really do. Here's another good question from a, doctor, a friend of mine, Dr. Kathleen, out in Newport Beach, and she says, you know, I see that pituitary adrenal activation there. Is that why this is so bad for your heart? Does that have something to do with it? Well, uh, I don't know, Rich. <laughs> you, 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 know, you know, Rich is the science guy. He can tell you all every little detail about that. I'm like, I know it causes it, and let's get it done. But, Kathleen, that's a great question. Yes, if you think about that little squirt of adrenaline, and it's every minute, every hour, every night, every week, every month that's saving our lives because our airway is closed down we're using up oxygen so that squirt of adrenaline helps open our airway but that same squirt of adrenaline acts on our heart so you heard guys say well when you look at that sleep study and you see their heart rate going up and down and off the charts we really think that's one of the things that's such a hard hard thing on your heart is that happening over and over and over talk about these outputs that you see Home sleep testing and polysomnograph testing measure much of the same things. One of the big differences might be for polysomnograph, we measure brain waves. We look at various channels, but some of the most important ones are the airflow, heart rate, O2 saturations. As you look at these studies, and if you do some home sleep testing, one advantage about it, I think, is that you can have the data there in front of you. And I tell you, once you explain it to a patient and you show them this is their heart rate, this is their oxygen saturation. This is your breathing. And you show them a spot where they're breathing normal, and then you go to a spot on the test where they're not, and you say, look, you're flatlining here. Patients don't like it when they flatline. That's a word that uh, kind of disturbs them. And then they see their heart rate go up and their oxygen goes, go down. After a little bit of educating what those signals are, the patients will get that, and they, they want treatment. They want it yesterday. Good point. This is the tube that we're talking about, the airway, the straw. 
we have opposing forces acting on this. We have muscles that are trying to keep our airway open and we have air that's moving through there. So when you think about when we take a deep breath in, the negative pressure in our abdomen increases. And as we do that, that air moving through there is trying to collapse that tube or that straw. I'd like to use the analogy of sucking up uh, ice cream, a thick milkshake through a straw. The harder you suck on that straw, the more that that thing wants to close down. So when you talk about this and you explain the, this to your patients, that tube or that straw analogy is a good thing that they can talk about.